why is it that women are not represented in anything like equitable numbers in the media world? You know, I, I, I don't know exactly how to say this, but I think it's a big conspiracy. <laughs> say more. When we started Nickelodeon, I had people counting the number of girls we had on our shows and what roles they had. And we actually did a pretty darn good job of reversing some of that. But it's Gina's data shows that whether if this was 1947 or 2012, 17% of women are represented in a crowd scene in a feature movie. 17% are main characters. You never get above 17%. Now, I ask you, do you know what percentage of our Congress right now is women? 17%. 17% ends up being a really interesting thing. Because if we just always see a world where women are 17%, then you go to work in a corporation, and it's like, you know what, we've got about 17%. <laughs> they don't measure it, but they see it. It's like, oh yeah, that's just about the way the world I see on TV, or I, the world I see uh, in film. And I know from my work experience in the world that unless women get to 30%, which is a real tipping point, we're not normal. You know, once we're 30% of a population, then it's normal, even though we're 51%. But if we got to 30%, that would be a very big change. Now, I take another stance, which is, you know what? Hey, we just got the vote about 100 years ago. Yeah. You know, we, we, we haven't been at this that long. And so we're very impatient. So I think these things take a lot of time to change. And I had a big epiphany in your office today, which in, office. in your office today, and I, I talked a little bit about it with our friend, Madam Google. <laughs> Jadine Gianfredi, yes, That's right, who's a graduate of the Leadership Scholars Program and a graduate of Rutgers and a graduate of Douglas Residential College. It's, it's, a, it's a funny epiphany to say, but I've spent my lifetime trying to help women get lifted up. Cable became a very good place for women. We had 25 women as heads of cable networks, big networks, Discovery, MTV, you know, big networks. And I was religious about making sure that there was a, a good and open place for women to emerge as leaders, which is, you know, a tough thing to commit to and to keep doing. But I never did what's on your poster which is for what purpose? For a just world, which is what is on your poster. And to me, until we get to that point where the conversation with women is not, how can we help you get ahead, but how can we get, help you get ahead so that we can change this? That hasn't, I have not seen that conversation go on as much as I do. In 1980, a little while back, I thought we had finally turned the corner on women as academics and minorities as, as academics. Because in 1980, we, most the big publics reached a kind of percentage, which was around 15%, that I thought would be the takeoff <coughs> percentage. It took off all the way past 17 to 23%. And that's where it's been for an entire generation, right? Well, in that generation, a whole lot of women got, and minorities got degrees. And a whole lot of them went into film and did a bunch of stuff. But somehow they didn't, they didn't break in. They, they couldn't figure out, I think, a lot of them, what was in the room, and nobody really opened the door for them. My advisor had a saying he used to say about academic departments. First-rate faculty hire first-rate faculty. Second-rate faculty hire third-rate faculty because they don't want to be embarrassed. When women embarrass men, men get really embarrassed, and they don't want to have them around. I have four sisters, I know all about it. <laughs> Honestly, um, you're asking the question about blockbuster movies. We have a much richer uh, realm of film available to people today, thanks to 
people like uh, Harvey Weinstein, who introduced really great independent film from all over the world to the United States of America. So we do have a richer palette of things that people can pick. But when you're, today, a blockbuster movie costs about $100 million to produce and about $100 million to market. And so nobody wants to take any big chances. And you know, I think that's, I, I do think it's a lot of economics. And I think it's that a lot of the women in the film side have had to operate as if they were uh, one of the guys. In my case, I did not have to operate like one of the guys because nobody wanted to run Nickelodeon. <laughs> nobody, it was a very undesirable job. And people would look with, you know, pathetically. My company asked me four questions in 16 years. That's it. At budget reviews and everything else because we figured out how to make it economically right. Doing the right thing for kids, we built a great business. Now, I'm not so sure what they're doing. And I don't think, I think they have a big, now they're a big machine. They have to churn out uh, toys. They this have is to, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. Yeah. Right. And so now they're much more subject to the overall, overarching economic formulas. Um, but I don't think the women who've been involved in the movie industry have uh, state that claim for what purpose you know they have they are just they just want to they want to they're more the boys than the boys they want to prove themselves that they can come up with a blockbuster hit that boys are going to go to and you know I think it's going to take some time um, before we see women in charge of studios who have a bigger consciousness for what is just and equitable.